welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan. EY has put out a report that says India is the top investment destination for foreign direct investment. In fact, it says that 32% of the companies that were surveyed by EY rank India as the most attractive market. India is in fact ranked higher than China, Brazil and Southeast Asian nations. Joining me now to discuss the highlights of the EY report and the policy prescription for the road ahead, Amitabh Khan, the Secretary of the DIPP and the man heading EY in India, Rajiv Memani. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining me on the CNBC TV 18 special. Mr. Kant, let me start by asking you, because while we have seen uh, positive moves as far as FDI is concerned, in fact, a 48% upsurge in FDI this year in dollar terms at about $30.8 billion in the first half of calendar year 2015. Given the global economic scenario, the global slowdown that we're currently witnessing, and also some setbacks on the reform front in India, do you believe this number is sustainable or can in fact be improved upon? Well, this number is going to uh, continue unabated. Uh, my view is that India is heading for a record FDI inflow this year. And this is largely a consequence of uh, macroeconomic uh, stability. There's fiscal consolidation in the Indian economy. There's uh, political stability. Uh, inflation is at an uh, all-time low. Uh, you know, we've had a reduction of 125 basis point during the last uh, 12 months uh, on the interest rates. And I think there's a huge push for all, all the stalled projects. So all the right things, I think uh, the direction is absolutely perfect. We are, we are, we give, the, the government has given a huge impetus to all the correct things. Rajiv Mamani, let me ask you, because, you know, while uh, the mood, uh, as far as India is concerned, is clearly much more optimistic than it was in 2014, for a lot of the reasons that Mr. Kant has already articulated. But let's talk about the road ahead. And I was alluding to the global factors, but let's also talk about the domestic factors. Uh, the survey that you conducted was done in the early part of 2015. Since then, we've seen a fairly stormy parliament session. Since then, we've seen setbacks on things like GST, etc., which, by the way, in your survey is highlighted as one of the key reforms that foreign investors are looking forward to. Do you believe that the mood perhaps may be dampened a tad at this point in time on account of, uh, of some of the setbacks that we've seen in the local economy? No, Shireen, I, I continue to believe that uh, there is a general level of optimism that still prevails. And in fact, I would say that it's, it has been on the increase. Uh, on the regulatory reform side, also on the tax side, while you know uh, there are still a lot of lingering issues, but at least the effort of the government, you know, once this mad thing was sorted out, the border phone issues. So I would think that overall the mood is still buoyant. I think the key thing from a government standpoint, I would say, which will really change the tide even further, would be if some of the if the demand in India starts 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 growing further. And, and, you know, if some of the large contracts are issued, some large projects get on stream, uh, whether it's in defense or it's in railways or it's in infrastructure, I think people are ready to come in. Uh, I think they are very enthused by the reception that they're getting from the current government. They are very enthused by the, uh, the, the what they're hearing, what they're seeing, uh, also some of the things that are happening on the ground. When you look at the global picture, growth in FDI has actually uh, gone down or declined 3% when we look at the global picture. Even uh, as far as the Asia-Pacific region is concerned, India has clearly outpaced the growth of FDI in the Asia-Pacific region as well. But Mr. Khan, let me talk to you specifically about FDI into manufacturing. And this perhaps is the heartening story at this point in time because FDI and manufacturing, as per this report, has grown at the fastest pace that we've seen in the last seven years. You know, we've been talking and you and I have discussed this, the likes of Foxconn, and so on and so forth, setting up assembly facilities in India. How confident do you feel about continuing to attract big ticket dollars when it comes to manufacturing? I think there are two very unique findings about this report. One is uh, uh, this, the fact that uh, FDI has seen a huge resurgence as far as manufacturing is concerned. And uh, my view is uh, that this, uh, this is a huge, huge uh, plus for this government because uh, I think manufacturing is the area which is going to create jobs. And therefore, we've mm. seen in recent times all the, all the mobile manufacturers actually manufacturing in India for the domestic market. We've seen Siemens, we've seen Daimler, we've seen uh, GE, we've seen just about every top 
uh, company of the world coming in to manufacture mm. here. And my belief is, my belief is that uh, India will become a very, very attractive destination for marketing for various reasons. One of which is that uh, in terms of sheer cost differential, uh, yeah. India will be far better placed uh, than China simply because the wage rates in China have increased enormously over the last uh, mm. three years. But I think the second unique finding of this uh, study is the fact that by 2020, India will be one of the top three economies. India will be a regional uh, and a global hub for manufacturing. Mm. And that they'll, India will be one of the top three manufacturing nations of the world. I think those three findings are very, very remarkable as far as uh, this particular study is concerned. Speaking of this uh, ease of doing business, Rajiv Mamani, if I were to ask you, uh, and there have been several bold measures that have been taken, or at least measures that were anticipated would have been taken by the previous government that have been pushed through by this government when it comes to opening up FDI across sectors. Defense has now gone up to 49%. We've seen liberalization as far as the insurance sector is concerned. But let me ask you about those two sectors in specific, since we're talking about Make in India uh, and we're talking about the growth of the financial services sector. Uh, despite the fact that several uh, partners, existing joint venture partners, have already applied for FIPB approval and so on and so forth, almost 10 or 11 months down the line, we actually haven't seen any money come in for the insurance sector. Similar story seems to be playing out even as far as the defense sector is concerned. Rajiv Mamani, why do you think that is the case? So, uh, I would say in the defense sector, I think the key thing will be, I think the defense contracts, the large defense contracts still have to be issued. Uh, I think there is some uh, more clarification on policy that's required. Uh, so, I think people are ready, uh, uh, a lot of companies are investing a lot of time and money to understand what's happening. Uh, I think they are ready with their plans. By the, but by the time they roll it out, I think it will take, you know, the contracts will have to be issued. That, unfortunately, have not yet been issued. And some more clarity on the procurement policy, some more clarity on the offset policy, I think those things will be required. Uh, yeah. So I think once that's done, it will take, because defense are, you know, large contracts. Without the contracts, people are hesitant yeah. to put in the uh, manufacturing capacity. On the on insurance side, I think, uh, uh, you know, valuations, uh, IRDA clearances, FIPB approvals, understanding between partners plus some issues around uh, you know management control you know what does management mm. control mean and everything yeah, else yeah. i think those mm. issues are you know somewhere the whilst the 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 percentages have been changed i think there are some yeah. uh, peculiarities that have come in terms of management control i think that's been a bit of a dampener but i would say yeah. at least four or five of these applications are now moving ahead and i'm hopeful that in the next you know 3 to 4 months you will see, uh, you know, some amount of foreign capital come in. Also, may look at some companies listing uh, in 12 to 18 months' time. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Kanta, you know, let me put the same question to you. Do you accept that, uh, uh, you know, while there was liberalization in sectors like insurance, we didn't really keep pace with what needed to be done on the regulatory front? It got caught up in all of these issues of ownership and control. Do you feel confident that we are likely to see fresh money coming in into the insurance sector? And also, uh, you know, when it comes to defense, the offset policy, the new procurement policy has been in the making. We were expecting it uh, a while back. We still have no clarity on whether we will get those new policies by the end of this year or not. Do you feel that somewhere we are perhaps squandering an opportunity? So uh, my belief is that uh, defense manufacturing will be one of the key drivers of India's growth. I mean, there's a huge, huge possibility. Uh, I think a lot of more orders need to flow from the defense uh, ministry. Uh, the defense offset policy is at a very, very advanced stage. I think a number of decisions have been taken uh, for future as far as offset policy is concerned. I think they need to set right a couple of things with retrospective effect. The defense procurement policy is also at its final stages and I think in the next two to three months you'll see a huge huge movement altogether on the defense side and my, my personal belief is that defense will just get cracked in one shot mm. and you'll see a lot of investment coming in. In fact that will be the biggest driver of India's manufacturing in the years to come. On the insurance side we've moved from 26 to 49. There 
have been issues of control and ownership. To my, my mind, we need to grandfather the existing arrangements so that there's no, there's absolute clarity on this. Having said this, I think four or five proposals have already are before the FIPB. They should get approved. Uh, and I think you'll see a lot of more investment coming in in the insurance side. So both insurance and defense, you know, from the point, from the time the decisions were taken, it's been hardly three to four months. I think these are sectors which take about minimum six to seven months. And I think in the next right. three to four months, you'll see huge inflows, huge inflows. In fact, they will be the key drivers of FBI inflows into India in the coming years. Okay. Mr. Kant, let me also ask you a question really on what we're seeing happen as far as these uh, plurilateral deals are concerned. We've seen the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal being inked, the trade deal being inked led by the U.S. We've now got negotiations currently underway as far as the RCEP is concerned. Do you believe that India's role when it comes to global trade is perhaps going to be impacted on account of these large plurilateral deals, specifically the TPP? And could that then impact what we're talking about today? So, uh, Shireen, we are in a globalized world. Uh, you know, uh, India must become a very integral part of this global supply chain. Uh, if you look around the world, uh, there are globalized agreements taking place, and India must become a very aggressive, a very, very dynamic player in these globalized trade agreements. If we do not, then our manufacturing will get impacted over the long run. And therefore, to my mind, it India must prepare its players. India must become, uh, prepare itself to become a very, very, uh, bring its regime on part, uh, on, glo on global levels totally. Mm. And India must not only push through RCEP, but become a very key player as far as all other global trade agreements are concerned. I mean, this is absolutely critical. This is imperative for India to become a great manufacturing nation. Our manufacturing. So do you believe that the time, is, time is ripe also, sir? Would you then say that the time yes. is ripe also for us to, uh, to try and uh, resuscitate the talks which have been derailed as far as the India-EU FTA is concerned? Should the government not prioritize that? Yeah. I'm a great believer that India-EU uh, agreement is necessary, it's good for India, it has to be a win-win, but India has become a center for compact car manufacturing, India is a center for auto component parts, and these cars which are manufactured in India must find Europe as a very major key market, our pharmaceuticals, mm. our uh, auto components must penetrate European markets, it's important, uh, our textiles must penetrate European markets. Yeah. And uh, it's therefore important to my mind that India-EU agreement will be in to a great benefit uh, to, of Indian manufacturers. Can I add something on this? I think three, four things. One is I, I do believe TPP and other agreements will have an impact. I mean, I think there's no doubt that TPP is a historical agreement. Uh, but I think as India enters these agreements, as, as Mr. Khan said, I think we have to be careful that we protect our interests as well. And I think two or three things that I would definitely recommend. One is, you know, the anti-dumping, you know, products coming in from China, number of industries getting impacted. I think we'll have to react faster. And secondly, industry by industry, sector by sector, we will have to see how are we getting integrated in the global supply chain and how are we ensuring that we are competitive from a manufacturing standpoint. So whether it is textiles or it's autocomp or it's leather, whatever that is. I think that's very, very, so next stage of, of, of make in India has to be that, that you go granular and go, go industry by industry. Time for us to take a break, but when we return, we continue our conversation with Amitabh Kant and Rajiv Memani on EY's FDI Attractiveness Survey.